Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you this morning, Lord God, for your great love, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into this, your house, Lord God, into this place. Uh, It just feels right again, just gathering together, massing together for Christ as your body, Lord, as your family, as brothers and sisters, Lord God. Thank you this morning for another day of life, Lord God. We count our blessings. We recognize even the breath that we are breathing now, Lord, is a gift from you. But all of these gifts point us back to the greatest gift of all, Jesus. And that's why we're here this morning, Lord. We're not here for any religious reasons. We're here for Jesus. And we acknowledge that. We thank you so much, Lord God. We know you're here in this place. And so be glorified. Speak to us as as we spend just a few minutes in your word, Lord God. Encourage us. Prepare us, Lord God. And remind us again what this holiday is truly all about. We love you. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning once again. If you have a Bible, let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. If you have a Bible, let's turn to the book of Matthew chapter 1. Amen. We bring our Bibles to church. And so Matthew chapter 1. Give you guys a few seconds to turn there. As you do, I read a story. I read a story about a little girl, a wise little girl, who after unwrapping all of her presents was asked the question, honey, did you get everything you wanted for Christmas? (laughs) She said no. But then she had a better comeback. She said, but it wasn't my birthday anyway. But it wasn't my birthday anyway. I love that. And she's a wise little girl for saying that. Now, had this little girl had the wrong understanding about what Christmas is about, again, she would have been an unhappy camper, right? But she understood. She understood, and and having that right perspective is very important in all of life, right? At any age. Now, for those of you that might have already opened some of your presents, I'll ask you that same similar question. Did you get what you wanted for Christmas, right? Is Christmas everything that you hoped it would be? Now, if your answer is no, then it's very quite possible that you have the wrong perspective about Christmas, right? Because all of us have already given, been given the greatest gift that we could ever have, and that gift is Jesus, all right? It's not about the, the presents, right? It's not about the trees or the lights or the food. And and again, that's great. There's nothing wrong with these things. Of course, it's wonderful to celebrate and to get together with family. But always remember this, that we can have all the gifts, the trees, the lights, and even Santa, right? But you can't have Christmas without Christ. You can't even spell it. I love that, right? You can't even spell Christmas, which makes Jesus the real reason for the season. It's all about Jesus. It's all being brought back and reminded again what this day is truly all about. I'll say it again. The word Christmas means gathering together for Christ. It's massing together for Christ as we celebrate the greatest gift that God ever gave to mankind. This morning, I want to remind you again that Christmas is not about the gifts, It's about the giver. It is all about the giver. Because we have to remember again what the Bible teaches, what Jesus specifically said about things. What did Jesus say about things? He said in Luke 9, 25, for what does a prophet a man or woman, if they gain the whole world, if they get every gift and yet lose their own soul? Luke 12, 15, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things they possess. Okay? It is not about things. Remember at Christmas time that God knew exactly what we needed the most. And what we needed the most was him. Right? That's really what we needed the most. It's not about things. It's not about things. I want you to think about the fact that what good would it be if we were given everything, if we received everything that we wanted, and yet we died one day, and we lived the rest of eternity separated from God forever. What good would these gifts have been? 
They would have been temporary satisfaction only. Remember what we learned from the book of Genesis, that God created man to be in perfect fellowship with him forever. But their choice to sin separated, right? Not only Adam and Eve from God, but every one of their descendants, which is all of us, throughout the rest of history, right? And so we had a problem. Man was separated, found himself separated from God. And because every person is born a sinner, no one has the ability to fix the sin problem because we're sinners. To make it worse, because sin separates man from holy God, none of us could go to God to fix the sin problem. So what did God do? God came to us. And that's the story of Christmas. God came to us. What's so beautiful about Christianity, when you compare it to every other religion in the world, is every other religion is man's attempt to please their God. But how can a sinful man please their God? God is holy. Christianity is God's story of holy God coming to sinful man. We couldn't go to him, and so what did God do? God came to us. Man couldn't fix us. We can't fix it. Again, we're all sinners. God had to do something, or mankind would be lost forever. And so the story of Christmas teaches us, again, God's plan to fix what man had broken. God's plan, again, to restore the fellowship with mankind that had been broken in the Garden of Eden. And so God had a plan, and we find this plan in Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What I so love about this text, this quote, is Isaiah the prophet lived 700 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. 700 years. And this tells us something very interesting. So oftentimes, when we go shopping for gifts, right? How many of you are last minute shoppers? Last minute shoppers, right? How many of you were at the mall yesterday morning? Uh Uh-oh. Oftentimes, our gift giving is is spur of the moment, right? It's a knee joint reaction. We have to do something. We got to grab that. And and we just grab these last minute gifts to give. But how many of you know God's not like that, right? For 700 years, God planned the perfect gift. I love that, right? 700 years before it took place, Isaiah speaks. He speaks of a prophecy of God's promise that a child would be born, that a son would be given. This tells us, again, that God's gift was carefully planned out, right? 700 years before, as a matter of fact, God's gift was prophesied in the Garden of Eden. Way back when, mentioned again, way back when, it was planned out carefully. It was boldly prophesied. It was widely announced throughout the entire Old Testament. And it was lovingly prepared and willingly given. This was God's gift. This is how special God's gift is. And we read about this special gift in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18. This morning, very briefly, let's look at the gift of Christmas, okay? The gift of Christmas. I'll begin reading verse 18. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed or engaged to Joseph, notice, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, Matthew makes it crystal clear here that Mary was pregnant prior to her and Joseph coming together intimately, okay? Prior to them getting together, she was already pregnant. And this is emphasized so that it's crystal clear that she was a pure virgin and yet pregnant. This baby, again, was not from Joseph. This was a baby from God, the Holy Spirit. 
Why was this necessary? Well, it was necessary because the baby, Jesus, again, needed to come from holy God. In order to fix man's problem of sin, Jesus could not be a sinner. Had he been born of Joseph, he would have inherited the same sinful nature as every one of us. And so Jesus had to be different. He had to come from holiness, which is why he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. The fact that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit means that he was sinless. He was holy. He was perfect. And he could do what none of us have ever been able to do, to live a perfect life, to please God, to satisfy satisfy God's perfect standard of holiness. Jesus was able to do that. None of us, again, have ever been able to do that. No man, no woman ever created. Verse 19, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. If you have a pen, you can write down the word Jesus is the word Yeshua. It's the Hebrew word Yeshua. In Greek, it's Jesus. The word means the Lord saves, and that's why this name is given to him, because as the angel declared, he will save his people from their sins. The word Christ, in case you're wondering, as many people refer to him as Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. We get that, right? It's not his last name. The word Christ means anointed one. It refers to him being the Messiah, the Messiah. Verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, again, Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. How beautiful, how beautiful that is. Matthew once again quotes another prophecy also by Isaiah. This one is quoted from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, another prophecy that Jesus' birth fulfilled. In case you're wondering what's very incredible about Jesus, is in his first coming alone, Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies, okay? Very important that everything that God declared, everything God promised, Jesus fulfilled. Isn't it awesome that God keeps his promises, right? That when God says something, he means it and he keeps it. This was a promise. Again, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he speaks of the virgin that would bear a son. He speaks of this child that would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, I already told you that the name Jesus means Savior, the Lord saves. Christ means anointed one. But now we are given a third title for the Lord, the title Emmanuel, which is already, we are already told means God with us. What does that say about Jesus? That Jesus is God. Pretty simple here, right? Don't need to be a rocket scientist to get this one. Jesus is God. He is the Son of God, but He is also God the Son. And so if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Jesus is His human name. Christ is His official title, the Anointed One. And Emmanuel describes who He is. He is God with us. God with us. Verse 24. When Joseph woke from sleep, He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. He called his name Jesus. On that famous night that Joseph named the baby Jesus, all that had been planned by God and written for centuries, prophesied again from the prophets. All of it came to pass. 
that God the Son left heaven's throne to restore the personal fellowship with man that had been broken. To do that, Jesus had to come take on human nature. He had to become one of us to do for us what none of us could have ever done for ourselves. This is the story of Christmas. John talks about this in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then in verse 14, John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I love that phrase, dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, what I love about this passage, and specifically verse 14, is that phrase, dwelt among us. Jesus came to dwell among us. Now, this phrase dwelt means to live in a tent. That's what it means, to live in a tent. But that's exactly what Jesus did, right? When he took on human flesh, he simply is God living in a tent. It's the Son of God living in a human body. All of this, again, is the beautiful picture of God with us, which reminds us, again, that Christmas time is much more than the presence, right? It truly is about God's presence dwelling among us. I'll say it again. It's so much more than presence. It's really about God's presence dwelling among us. As I close this morning, again, I'm reminded of a quote from one of the most wisest doctors that I've ever read. His name is Dr. Seuss. <laughs> he says this, and the Grinch, with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling, how could it be so? Christmas came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas perhaps means something much, much more? Christmas is about much, much more. Much, much more. Too often we want gifts from God more than we want God himself. But my last scripture I give to you this morning comes from King David. King David wrote a very beautiful passage again in Psalm 1611. King David says this, talking to God. He says, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Presents that we receive today will make us happy for a while, right? They bring us temporary satisfaction. But true fullness of joy doesn't come from a store, right? It comes from God's presence. It comes from Emmanuel being with us, right? God with us. This morning as I close, again, I ask you, is Emmanuel in you? Is Emmanuel in you? Because again, you will never know the true joy and true meaning of Christmas until Emmanuel dwells in your heart. You'll never know that joy until Emmanuel dwells in your hearts that God's presence with us is his greatest present to us. That God's presence with us is his greatest present to us. This morning as we pray and we close, we'll finish with a song. Whatever you do, right? Whatever gifts that you might have gotten or will get today, may they symbolize and remind you of the greatest gift that God gave to mankind, his son Jesus. Amen?
Merry Christmas to you all. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we thank you this morning, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for its truth. We thank you again for our time together in your house. Brief, Lord God, but meaningful. Thank you for family, Lord God. Thank you again for Jesus. All of this is for nothing without Jesus, Lord God. Remind us, Lord God, that at your presence, in your presence, is fullness of joy. We don't have to rely on the temporary things of this world to bring satisfaction when we can find contentment in your presence, Lord. Remind us that today, Lord, I pray for anyone in here that might be separated from you. Whose sin separates them from you. Remind them, Lord, that you have the solution to their problem. Their sin can be washed away. Their guilt, their shame can be washed away. We find that in you. That's the story of Christmas, Lord. We don't have to be held to the past. The chains can be broken, Lord. We can find deliverance. That's why you sent Jesus, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And so I pray this morning for someone in this place, Lord God, who might feel broken, who might feel separated from you, Lord God, that they would cry out to you this morning, Lord that they would acknowledge that you sent your son on their behalf and that everything your son did, living a perfect life that we could never live and then dying in our place, paying the penalty for the sins that we committed, that they would believe that, that they would acknowledge that you did it for them, that they would ask your forgiveness and they would ask that you would fill them with your spirit, Lord, that they too would be able to enjoy your presence. Oh, I pray for that person this morning, Lord God, whoever that might be. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what Christmas is all about. Thank you for this brief reminder that we have this morning. Whatever we do today, wherever we go, whatever we do, Lord, bless our time. Be in our midst. Remind us, Lord God, that we would always seek your presence. We love you. We thank you, Lord. We wish Jesus a happy birthday as we give you the glory, the honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Merry Christmas once again. God bless you guys.